the organization that helped recruit freshman Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in 2018 is hoping that their playbook nets another win in 2020. So far, Justice Democrats have endorsed eight newcomers and are backing seven incumbents, including AOC, Ayanna Presley, and Ro Khanna. The goal is to recruit candidates who are demographically and ideologically in line with their districts. Joining us now to discuss their strategy for the 2020 races is Executive Director of Justice Democrats, Alexandra Rojas. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. All right, so tell us a little bit about the, um, you've endorsed a number of incumbents, but tell us about the new folks, the challengers that you've endorsed, who you're excited about. Yeah, I mean, we're excited about all of them. Of course. Uh, but I think that, you know, you see candidates like Jessica Cisneros, who would be, again, one of the youngest members of Congress ever elected, running down close to the border in, in Laredo in Texas's 28th district, and she's challenging Henry Coyar. Um, so he is... Uh, the number one, dem uh, not just Democrat, but Congress member that's taken money from private prison and private detention center, again, right close to the border, who's voted uh, in the last Congress 70 percent of the time with Donald Trump. And Jessica is born and raised from Laredo and is a working class champion that is championing a progressive message that stands in such stark contrast, right, to someone like mm -hmm. him. Uh, so there's candidates like her and Jabal Bowman, who's running in New York's 16th district, um, who's who's also incredibly exciting, challenging another corporate Democrat. Uh, so we're taking the fight so, <laughs> uh, to, against corporate Democrats. Tell me how you choose which candidates that you're going to back. Is it race by race? Is it particularly on the opponent? I know one thing Ryan Grammy comes on the show to talk about often is mm -hmm. about going after particularly people in the positions of power within the Democratic Party, some of the committee chairman like that. So tell us a little bit, take the audience behind your process whenever you decide who to endorse. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always important to remember what we're fighting for. I think at the end of the day, like, yes, we're challenging corporate Democrats, folks that deserve to be challenged, but we're also electing champions of their communities. Um, and so I think it's part art and part science, the art part being that our process rests on a nomination process, so folks from their community from across the country can nominate folks uh, that you know, should be represented in Congress. But I also think that the science part, and that's like the qualitative, quantitative research, I think that's the ideological uh, aspect of the incumbents. So I think the powerful committee positions or uh, where there's a clear divide with like a Henry Coyar, mm -hmm. but there's also uh, the Joe Crowleys who, right. you know, might not be measured on the same metric. So I think it's it's both mm -hmm. um, th who they are and like their experience and what they're taking to office and also uh, is this seat going to, to cause the shift in the political landscape we need right, yeah. sure. to shift the Democratic Party. Have you seen a sort of AOC affect this cycle? And what I mean by that is, you know, she was really groundbreaking in terms of defeating Joe Crowley, coming out of nowhere and being this progressive champion, yeah. representing a grassroots movement. And it's obviously garnered a lot of attention, a lot of excitement across the country. So have you seen more candidates, more, you know, people who are in line with their district, who champion the same progressive values that you do, stepping up to challenge incumbents this cycle around versus last cycle? Yeah, I mean, I think people's minds in terms of what's possible has totally shifted. Um, I think in voters' minds, in, in here in D.C., right, with the yeah. punditry class, sure. uh, and I think even within the, the Democratic Party, but to your point, I, it, it's not enough. I think that's why this year is really, really important to show that um, you know, these challengers have, have a real force, and I think we're showing that with the recent fundraising numbers for, for this past quarter. Mm. Um, you know, I, we always like to point to the fact that AOC in the first year in 2017, right, before uh, she, you know, the last few months of the campaign where she raised more money, had about $60,000. And you have folks like Jessica Cisneros, who's going to be the youngest congresswoman ever elected, like her, uh, running in one of the poorest districts also in America, that you know, rate has already raised close to four hundred thousand uh, dollars, and it's not even twenty twenty yet. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, it's it's shifted totally in the minds of voters and the punditry class of what's possible, mm -hmm. and I think is is huge for what it means for twenty twenty. Yeah, that money part is such a great point. Yeah, yeah. it is. I mean, I, I'm wondering like how you are, how you guys are thinking about your overall impact on the Democratic Party. Have you accomplished? at least some of what you want to accomplish, and what really is the end goal? Is it to abolish corporatism from the Democratic Party? Just speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's everything that we mm. think about. Um, at the end of the day, justice, you, you know, the work that we do is like, yes, it's Justice Democrats, and it's the organization that we're building, but at, 
we want these solutions to actually get passed, right? We want Medicare for all. We want a Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, we want um, an economy that works for everybody and a democracy that isn't uh, bought by corporations. And so we think that the strategy that we've employed, right, with engaging in competitive primaries to not only build power by having representatives in Congress that vote on this legislation, but also win on our issues because it's totally shifted, right? Like Bernie in 2016 running in the primary has done so much for the Medicare for all debate. Uh, AOC being in office has done so much to shift the debate uh, on Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, you know, we have a lot of the political <laughs> game that we have to play with the reality of who's in the White House right now and what we have to do in 2020 to, to defeat Republicans and to defeat Donald Trump. Uh, but the end goal is always going to be, um, yeah, to, to, to win on these issues and to make sure that... Let me ask you this question about electability, because this is what I hear all the time when we're debating presidential politics yeah. and, like, do we have to go with an Amy Klobuchar to have a chance <laughs> at, at winning, or can you actually embrace a more progressive candidate? And one of the talking points I hear all the time is, well, we won the House with these centrists, with the Connor Lambs of the world. Those are the districts where that's how we won back the House. Ergo, that's the kind of candidate we have to run at the presidential level. What do you say to those folks? I... I think that the Democrats of today look a lot, you know, different. The Democrats of 2006 look a lot different than the Democrats of right now. And so even when you look at the Democrats of today, they're a lot more progressive than uh, in other cycles. And so when you think about and, and look at what voters support in the polls when it comes to bold action on climate change, doing something big on gun reform, especially in these past 2018 elections, uh, taxing the rich and creating an economy that uh, works for everybody. Those are issues that are being championed, right, by uh, some of the most popular politicians right now, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and other Democrats. So I think that there's space being created to go bigger for all Democrats, um, you know, regardless of how many people are in the House. So I think it's important to acknowledge that the general ecosystem of what's possible has totally shifted, and that has benefited uh, moderate and more progressive yeah. members. But it's it's really tip of the spear. Right. Yeah. Not to mention that, of course, establishment Democrats fight candidates like the type you you champion yeah. to the nail. So right. they're like forcing you to nominate centrists, and then we're like, look, centrists won. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, climate, you know, is in the debate right now, and it's one of the biggest existential threats facing humanity. And that wasn't the issue that folks were championing, but, you know, mm. um, progressives are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, shifted it. Alexander, you, Alexandra. great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on Rising, Bloomberg 2020 and billionaires complaining about a wealth tax raise a pretty important question. How did our economic system become this divided? Author Matt Stoller takes us on a 100-year journey of the war between monopoly power and democracy. Fascinating conversation when Rising returns.